Welcome to the Epic Highs and Lows of D&D Villainy. Um, we're here to teach you how to make memorable villains for any TTRPG table, really. We specifically um, really like D&D. &D. Yeah. Um, my name is Sloane. This is Liv. Um, Liv is a professional multimedia artist um, during the day and a very anxious DM at night. <laughs> She really specializes in writing and narrative storytelling, both in game and in her day job. She really knows how to make sure that people are engaged, that they're interested in what she's telling, and how to pull on the heartstrings in your intrigue to get you to go exactly where she wants you to go and make the choices that she thinks are going to be the most interesting. Even though you're sitting there going, no, this was totally my decision. Um, this is Sloane. She has been my DM for the past seven years, and she's the reason that I got into D&D in the first place. Um, she's the one that encouraged me to play. She's the one that encouraged me to try DMing, even though I am a very anxious DM. Um, Sloane is incredibly good at table presence. She's very skilled at finding a voice for a character and then finding other like, distinctive characteristics about the way they speak in terms of rhythm and word choice and um, inflection. She's also incredible at creating large casts of NPCs that are all um, very distinct, all work really well together, and that are, have a lot of detail and in, in nuance in their relationship. Um, and this means that a lot of times, because she tends to make large casts of villains, her villains are really excellent, and there's a lot of them. Uh, that being said, also, um, if for some reason we're discussing, we're talking, we're explaining, and someone has the desire to go, um, actually, I'm going to ask that um, you actually don't do that. Um, if you want to have a debate or a discussion, I'm more than happy to do it afterwards, but this panel is only 60 minutes long, and when I tell you our content takes up 50 minutes of it, when no one like has a comment or a question, I am being so sincere. Um, with that, I think we are good to go. Thank you. It's okay. All right, so first, we are going to break things down in non d, &D and we're going to talk about what makes a great villain or a memorable villain in general. Um, and we've divided this down into a couple different categories. We have their motivation, which is why they're doing what they do. Um, a lot of this times that is one of the most compelling parts of a villain and the thing that people like the most, but it can also be the simplest in terms of they're just evil. So it really depends on how you are running them. Um, we have their righteousness and their validation, which is why they feel valid and correct in doing what they do. Um, this is usually where you get a lot of that distinctive personality between different villains um, and that, that good flavor that everybody likes. Um, aesthetic, in the words of Megamind, is all about presentation. This is usually what people see first when they look at a villain. It is the super cool castle, it's the really excellent outfit, it is the, just the whole vibes. Yeah. My most recent example is Drolta from Castlevania and Octurne. I just want to put myself on blast. Yeah. Fully the reason I started watching the show. She's amazing and beautiful. Um, there's also their persistence, which is their uh, like just non-stop drive in pursuing their goal. Uh, a lot of times this is what makes people like, actually scary, is that like, the extent to which they will go to achieve their goals and ruin the lives of your characters. Um, and then this is an optional characteristic of your villain being sympathetic, which is whether they're in full control over their situation or not. Um, and whether they are someone that has either uh, like trauma or tragedy or something that is driving them that makes you feel for them as a character, that they're not just doing this to be evil per se, but they have a different reason. And uh, as you can see, it's to the left. Um, we've got three different examples up there, and Azula and um, Jinx are very obvious examples. Azula's just absolutely insane, and I'm, I know in like the comics they get into her motivation and like her trauma a little bit more, but in the show at least she's really compelling just because she's so evil, she's so mean, and she's so persistent. And Jinx is a really good example of just a through and through sympathetic villain. She's got a great aesthetic, a really distinct design, she's really trying to do her best every step of the way, and every step of the way she is messing it up and making it worse. And she ends up becoming the bad guy because of the way like it just keeps snowballing. Um, and then the really crazy guy up there, um, I don't expect anyone in this room to know, but man, does he look fantastic. Um, <laughs> his name is Kilby. He's from a French cartoon called Wok Fu. Um, and quite frankly, like he nails every single category we've put up here. Um, he's part of a reincarnating race. He's the only member of said race that remembers his past lives. And he remembers the exact like millennia where they were pushed to the brink of extinction. And now that they're slowly starting to like recover, he sees them making the exact same mistakes 
over and over and over. And in order to like stop that and to save his race, he's trying to commit genocide about it. Um, so you hear that, you're like, oh, that's so cool. That's like, oh, wait, hold on, no. We can't do that. And you spend most of this, it's a season of the series, right? Most of the season being like, wow, he's such a cool dude. Like, he really knows what he's doing. Oh, he's an old man. And then he goes insane. And you're like, oh. And you're like, wow, I liked you before, but now that you're the bad guy, you're a lot cooler. Um, and so taking characters from current media that you know and love and being able to really break down their categories like this is a really good way to deconstruct what you like in a villain and help you build your villains. It just makes it more approachable and a little bit more organized if you're sitting there and you like, don't know where to start. I'm going to make sure. Okay, cool. Just want to make sure. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to go specific to D&D or tabletop games. Um, we're going to talk about what makes a great villain in D&D, because they are distinct. Um, and we've divided this into two different kind of overall categories to talk about what makes a villain effective at the table. Um, so we have personality, which you're going to recognize some of the bullet points here. You've got the motivation. You've got their righteousness. The one that's different. <laughs> Um, is characterization. So if you remember like your high school English classes, that's your indirect characterization and that's your direct characterization. It's what people say about them and it is how they portray themselves and how those do or do not align with one another. Meanwhile, in the second category we have mechanics, which isn't quite the right word for what we're going for, but it's the closest title for the three that we have here. So you have table presence, how you say things, the way you present yourself, the way you might leer at your party across the table, or in our case, the ways you try to get your table presence across on Skype. Um, you then also have ruthlessness, which has like a silent parenthesis after it, which is in strategy. It is instilling the fear of God in your players. And this is a mechanic because you can have a heavy hitter, you can make it like, oh, well, they do 50 points of damage with one hit. And they're still not necessarily going to be scary or memorable. Your players might just actually be mad with you. So you have to execute it, like execute their stat block and their strategy in tandem with one another for them to really be frightening or at least memorable. Which does take us to the last one, which is stat blocks. You don't have to make your own stat blocks. And honestly, this might be better um, summarized as combat design. You want to give your players something new. You want to give them something unique. You want to give them something that's going to actually make them think and struggle with your combat so it's not whack, move, whack, miss, whack. Okay, they're dead. Um, so that is how your like, combat design and like the settings that you put them in are going to come together to really create that memorable combat situation that so many people really want their villains to have. Um, some pop culture examples that we do have listed up here are, they're really just Critical Role and um, The Adventure Zone, mostly because I've tried listening to Dimension 20 and I just don't personally like it. Not shade to anyone who does, please don't take it that way. Um, but Lucian from Critical Role Campaign 2, um, he honestly knocks it all out of the park. The one, the thing about him that really stands out to me though is his stat block, like his abilities and the way that Matt Mercer ran his combat, super unique. Personally, I wouldn't run it that way, but it is still really memorable and I think about it a lot because I don't think I would have ever run something that way. I don't think I would have thought of it. And it was a really cool execution that he used for a um, reoccurring character. Then we have Edward and Lydia from the Adventure Zone Balance. They're from a little art called The Suffering Game. And while I sit here and I'm like, oh my god, no, it's totally their personality that makes them stand out. It's not. It's their table presence and it's their ruthlessness. You could get them, you could just listen to The Suffering Game and you would fall in love with Taz because they are so striking, they are so scary. And for why? They're like glorified pop stars like the entire way through. And it's such an interesting execution that makes them really memorable, even though I don't actually think you get into combat with them at all. And then last but not least, we have the Briarwoods. It's specifically from the Legends of Vox Machina, though, the animated version, because it's a one-for-one -one translation of D&D into modern media. And it is so easy to break down these categories and then look at the Briarwoods and be like, oh, this is how they did this. This is how they did this. I can totally see how at the table, this is probably how this was played out. And really analyze like what you were going for and like the way they were executed 
and compare them and take notes and learn. They were so striking when we watched The Legends of Vox Machina for the first time. I just, they're some of my favorite villains, just period. And I don't know that I would actually like them as much at the table as I did in the show. Very scary. But Matt Mercer always just nails his villains, in my opinion. Uh, with this, we are going to, each of us are DMs and we play in each other's campaigns. So we are going to provide some examples from our own campaigns that we felt that were very effective. So we can give you both the DM perspective of here's what I was designing, and then <laughs> here's how my players experienced it. So you can get both the design and the feedback on how effective it was. Um, we are going to have to give a little bit of context for our campaigns, specifically mine, because it's kind of an unusual format. And so when you hear me referring to things, you need to know what's going on. Um, so just a brief summary, my campaign takes place in a, a mysterious tower that appeared um, that nobody knows what it is, where it goes, what happens when you go into it. People have been disappearing into it for centuries and no one has ever come out. Um, my party ends up getting sent into it and they discover that every single level, like every floor essentially of this tower is like a different world. Um, so there's a completely different setting, there's a completely different environment, new characters, new plotline, every single level. So if you hear me say, oh yeah, they're on this level of the tower, that's what I'm talking about. Mine's a little less necessary. It's just weird when we run through this and I don't give you the context. Um, I run a high magic, like anti-imperialist kind of campaign, and I have so much world building for it. My players were so invested in it that I started doing little like self-contained sessions when people were like, I have plans this Friday. And I'm like, yes, with me. And like, no. With like my boyfriend. I'm like, mm. We had standing plans, but okay. More important. Um, so the first two on this are from like the main campaign, and the last one is from kind of like a prequel kind of setting. Uh, yeah. it's, it's very far back. She's got the main campaign and the one the one shots technically are very very far back in the same world. Okay, um, with that, we're gonna go ahead and start with my three villains. Oh, I do want to point out real quick, because I just like to brag on her. She drew every single piece of art you're going to see in this um, presentation. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. It's really just my excuse to think and talk about D&D more, so that's what I do. Um, so my first villain was actually, she was, well, my first villain in my examples was from the second level of my campaign. Um, and if you're looking at her and you're like, that's a child, that is exactly how my players felt. Um, so I really, with Arya, wanted to create a moral like quandary for my players. I wanted to make them stuck. I wanted them to have no idea how they were going to handle this. Um, and so she is ultimately um, an exercise in like creating a helpless and sympathetic villain. Um, so to give you some context for her story, when my players came to this level, they had heard about kind of an evil queen that had created this um, cursed item that allowed her to alter reality. Um, and that she was using it to turn her own citizens into like undead instrument monsters. Um, and that she had flooded the castle town so no one could escape and um, was like ruining the crops and making it just impossible to survive here. Um, and so my players were like, okay, that sounds really bad. We should kill her. She sounds terrible. And I was like, yeah, you should. Um, and they ended up going through this whole town, getting information from the um, townsfolk, and eventually when they got to the castle, they found out, oops, never mind, the person who started this whole process was the queen's, was the queen's mom. The current queen is actually a 12-year-old, um, and she inherited this reality-altering item from her mother, and is now terrified of the power it has, um, and she's just reacting to the situation around herself. She's making people into instruments because she doesn't want to be around Silas. She's forcing people to stay near the castle because she doesn't want them to leave her. Um, and so the way that you can kind of execute that is be very careful with your indirect characterization versus your direct characterization. So in this case, I had built up the idea of someone that didn't exist with the indirect characterization, or someone that did, but it just wasn't accurate anymore by telling them about this ruthless queen and letting them imagine someone who is selfish and like evil to the core. And then when they got there, the direct characterization was someone who was terrified. Um, and a key to making a sympathetic villain that is really going to impact your players, because if you have a party of murder hobos, they're probably not going to do it. Um, one, you have to make sure you know your players. That's always the case. But two, you have to make a villain that is standing directly in the way of your player's progress, so they absolutely have to face them, but they also absolutely have to face the helplessness that your villain is in. 
And if you can do that, you've created someone sympathetic, and it should stop your party. Um, so in this case, she had the key for them getting off this level and going to the next level. They had to absolutely deal with her, and she was not letting go of the key. Um, from my player perspective, just so you know, I was so angry with her. Um, I was also angry with my party. We were fighting about this for probably, I'm going to say an hour and a half, both in character, and then we were playing on New Year's Eve, um, so we took a break 15 minutes before the ball drops, we have some fun, whatever. I um, mean, we were still arguing about it. About half the party's like, I'm going to kill the kid. I was like, why are you going to kill the kid? She's 12. You, what? Um, and it was straight up a dilemma that I don't think we solved that night, and I don't, we never ended up solving it. There was some weird loophole that uh, we ended up getting off on, so I did technically win that argument. <laughs> um, and it keeps coming up, actually, of like, she comes up a lot when we're discussing decisions and like, what's the right thing to do when the party's arguing and you have the people in the party who are a little less morally upstanding going, it doesn't really matter. And the other one's like, you know, you said that about killing a 12 year old too, so like, do I really take your opinion that seriously? <laughs> yeah, so as long as you know that there are, there's a variety of kind of moral standpoints in your party and that at least someone will be like, uh, I don't know if evil actions make an evil person you have an opportunity to create a moral dilemma for your players. And this is also really effective when you're not as comfortable with combat. Because I know when I first started as a DM, I was not very comfortable with combat. And so I wanted to create very like narratively striking villains without necessarily throwing you into a really hard boss fight. So that is where Arya came from. My ops was my party. Like, yeah, true. <laughs> they were just fighting for hours. Okay, and then my next villain that I have is from a completely different level of the tower. Um, this is Ravenna. Uh, yes, she is Raven themed, and I did name her Ravenna. It didn't or, like register me to me at the moment, but it's okay. We're gonna move on with it. Um, Ravenna is my excuse for being mean to my players, okay. uh, practicing being mean to my players, because that's something that I really struggle with. I've mentioned that I'm a very anxious DM. Um, I get worried about going too far or cutting off opportunities for agency or making someone upset by pulling something that they didn't have any chance to avoid. Ravenna is my practice of being in control of the information that I am giving my players, the information that they have, and then my response to it. Um, and so kind of the way that you can achieve that is you have to keep track of two things. You have to keep track of your villain's logic and make sure it is very, very sound. I'll give you an example in a minute to show you what that means. Um, and then second, you have to keep track of information. Not necessarily the information you're giving, the information the party has heard and received, because that's different. The information the party is acting on, the things they forgot, and the things that your villain has learned. So, um, to give you an example to explain some of that, Ravenna is a doppelganger. I did the classic thing, and I infiltrated my D&D party with a doppelganger, and they did not find out for like a full day. Um, and so, the way that I did this is I was keeping very careful track of what information I was giving my party, and I was keeping track of how they responded to it. I gave them, I think, over three or four different hints that Ravenna was more than likely a shapeshifter. They clocked it, they commented on it, and then they were not cautious about it at all. And I was like, you know what? Okay, all right, I'm gonna act on this. And when I, when I was saying, you know, be careful with your logic, I was looking at the situation and being like, okay, does Ravenna know that they have this item she wants? And I went, yes. Does she know that they think she might be a shapeshifter? Eh, she's not really sure, so she would probably try this because she's not being very cautious right now. Um, does she know that the party is split up currently? Yes. Um, and then I went, okay, done. I had her, I had her orchestrate it so that she um, kidnapped, quote unquote, one of the characters and then replaced them and came back into the party. Um, and the party didn't question it at all. <laughs> hey, hey, no, Sorry, one of my players questioned it. I questioned it. it. <laughs> no one else did. <laughs> Um, and so essentially what happened is I kidnapped this one character, the entire party was split, so there was one, she was off in a distance, which we'll talk about in a second. Somebody else was doing like a solo uh, infiltration heist mission, um, and so it just ended up that two of my party members were left alone and were going through the city. Um, and then when their third party member who had been kidnapped just reappeared, they're like, great, awesome, sigh of relief. And I was like, no, no, you should not be believed. <laughs> Um, and so they ended up not following through and questioning that character to the appropriate amount. They were not being cautious enough based off of the warnings that I had given them. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna jump you guys, and I did. Um, I ended up downing her character, I took one of them hostage, I almost made it out with all of my items out of, uh, um, out of that fight, but like they, they were forced to run because two of their party members were almost dead after this encounter. So, long story short, 
if you see your players slacking and you have evidence that you have given them enough warning and they were just ignoring it, jump them, act on it. Um, and then two, uh, what was the second one? It's gone. Doesn't matter. Sure, Go ahead and say your thing, it'll come back to me. Um, one, I'm never going to forgive my party members for this. <laughs> she RP's the most mundane thing. She's like, how do you get from this building to this building? And this girl just popped up and they're like, oh neat, she's here now conveniently in this place where she should not know we were going to be. I was like, isn't that convenient? Um, but really what to me makes Ravenna stand out is she's just so deliberate. She's so meticulous and it really does shine through. Um, and I'm going to take a step back real quick and brag again on her, on Liv specifically, because in order to execute ruthlessness and strategy, you as the DM also have to be very, very ruthless and very, very deliberate in the same way Ravenna was, which means there's this thing called the rule of three, which is essentially you signposting the information and the plot hooks and everything you want your players to pick up on. You need to say it to them at least three times, and you need to say it fairly clearly because they will take the first hint, I was like, oh, what an offhanded comment. The second hint, I was like, oh, that's weird. It's come up twice. And the third hint is probably the one where they finally go, hey, oh. what if that's important? Um, and as you can see, even then, it doesn't always work. It didn't work. Um, but Ravenna just is so deliberate all the time. She would get information, and she would always act on it. And it made it really scary to go about this city, because you knew that whatever you said was making it back up to her and anything you said could be in this just weird mixing pot of stuff she might know. <clears throat> and if we as players don't know what she knows, meanwhile our really mean DM knows everything that we know and everything Ravenna knows and is strategizing to use it against us at any given point in time. Yes, what's up? So for running a goal like this, and like you mentioned, you have to keep careful track of all the information flying around. Yeah. How, is that just meticulous of taking on your part? How did you make that easier on yourself to actually that's a good question. I'm not going to lie, I did kind of just keep it all in my head, which is not a, like a replicable thing. <laughs> to you. Um, I had to help her towards the end that of is this true. level, actually. Yes, you did. Um, I do checklists. I do, this is the hint I want to get, give three little boxes with like my mental notes of what those hints are, and every time I give one, I just check it off. Or I pre-prepare dialogue in my notes, and the second I say it, I cross it off. So then when I'm going back and I review my notes, I can see exactly what I did say, what I didn't say, if I only said half of a piece of dialogue, or if I've like highlighted something and I'm like, this did not happen, find a way to make this happen or put this information somewhere else because they need it. Yeah. I had a, I had a DM who used to record all of our sessions, mainly so he could like put them online, but, yeah. but it ended up actually being really useful for the players and the DM to go back and reference notes. So I didn't know, like you said you ran into one of your I, yeah. I don't know if you guys have ever recorded it and then used that as a way to be able to go back and see exactly what was said. No, that's a pretty good thought. We don't even read our session notes. <laughs> <No. laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do. When I was when I was planning this, I'd go back and read some of the session notes, and I double check with players, like, "Hey, did you say this thing?" And they'd be like, "No, why?" And I was like, "No reason." Mm -hmm. um, I, I remembered the advice that I was going to say earlier, <laughs> which is that um, if you can come up with a very like flow chart, you can make a PowerPoint presentation about your villain's logic. You're good. If it is one of those situations where your players are like, how did this happen? How could this, how did they get the jump on us? How did they get that information? And then a second later they go, oh, you're fine. Like that, that is your indicator that you have really thought things through. Um, and so that I think that played out last night when my character, my players were like, hey, how did she get this information? I explained it step by step and they were like, <laughs> they were so upset. Um, so if, if you can really track like on the most basic level, where and how each step of the logic is, that will really help you keep track of things and you just keep that in mind the whole time and are like reflecting and updating things as you go. I wish I had a more like concrete thing to tell you, but I, yeah, it, I didn't write it out anywhere. <laughs> okay, that all helps, thank you. Okay. Tweet. <laughs> okay, so this is my third villain. I'm going to be talking about <laughs> this looks that I need the mic for this one. Um, this is Gareth. Um, and she is going to be an actual two slide villain because um, she was very memorable on both the personality and the mechanics. Um, so first slide, I'm going to be talking about the personality aspect. 
Um, and the thing with Gareth that you need to know, that you can tell from the art, is that she is a lycanthrope. Um, she is a dire werebear specifically. Um, and I know werebears have a whole thing in D&D. I run them a little differently in my campaign. But what Gareth is ultimately a case study in is making a player specific or a character specific antagonist. So she was an antagonist, not necessarily a villain. She wasn't a villain to the whole party. She was just kind of a minor problem. I, I don't want to say, uh, in the grand scope. Okay, she had a huge impact, but she was designed to target one character specifically, and that was actually Sloane's character. Um, and so when you are designing a villain like this, you can keep the traits of your player character in mind um, and design something that is meant to unsettle them. So. Um, you do need the context of like who my PC is real quick for this. Um, I play like this little idyllic little 17 year old human fighter who is who was born from me going, you know what happens when famous adventurers have a kid? Like what kind of misconceptions do they have? What kind of like naivety do they have? What reality checks are they going to get through adventuring that they didn't get through PG filtered um, bedtime stories? And she took that and ran with it. I created a very hard reality check. Um, and so with this, it again kind of requires knowing your player's characters really well and being able to recognize the patterns in their personality, what your player are, um, was going for when creating them and what they still want to play with and like explore more. So if you notice a pattern, for example, I noticed that Corey holds her parents on an absolute pedestal and thinks that morality is like good morals can solve absolutely everything. Um, so I ended up creating an antagonist that genuinely had her life absolutely ruined by Corey's parents making a bad decision. It was actually like a good, you know, like morally, ethically, in their opinion, good, but like really bad decision. It was, it was a bad decision, and it, it is what turned Gareth into a lycanthrope in the first place. Um, and so in order to, I, that was kind of her backstory as I created something. She had a genuine like problem that I knew that Corey would agree with. Two, uh, her motivation and her righteousness, I designed to be things that Corey would also agree with, that she would look at and learn about and be like, ooh, hold on, hold on, wait, I see your point. I understand. I don't like how you're acting, but I see why you're acting like this. Um, and then on top of that, her characterization was opposite. Her characterization was meant to unsettle Corey. It was meant to make her feel threatened. Um, it was meant to like whittle away at her control over her environment um, and make Gareth seem like a very, very bad person, which she is. But then once you get underneath and find out her motivation and righteousness, the slap in the face was finding out that Corey agreed with her. It was really valid beef, and that was upsetting to figure out both as like a PC and as a player. Um, <laughs> because I was also sitting there as a player going, well, we've talked over this backstory so many times. What could you possibly like come up with? Like This is just misdirection, because that's what Liv does. And it was not. It was, your mother disarmed me in front of a lycanthrope, and then I got bit. Kill the kid. Oh yeah, my campaign does accidentally have like a repeated moral of kill the kid, which I don't. <laughs> it's, it's happening, happening. I'm sorry. It's happening. It happened it really on the does. second level. We first showed up on this level, got jumped by a bunch of bandits. Didn't kill the youngest member of them. That youngest member of them was like, revenge! Then they ended up killing the kid. Then this character was like, yeah, I had a kid in front of me, and your mom was like, don't kill it. Where it's like, mm, crazy, it's almost like I did I that. I did the exact same thing. Ooh, so, yeah. Then it ruined her life. I was like, wow. Yeah, so if you if you notice those patterns in your player characters, absolutely capitalize on them to make a really memorable villain. And then, when you actually get to the combat part of it, target your player, not your character. Um, so in this case, uh, Sloan is a very smart player. And I've seen this play out a lot in our different combats. She's very strategic. She always knows what she's doing. She's very in control of a fight. Um, and so I wanted to design something that was really, really challenging for her. And this was another exercise in me trying to be ruthless to my players because I knew this would be something Sloan would really like. None of my other players would like this. They would not appreciate it if I jumped them like this, but Sloan loved it. Um, and so in this case, uh, I kind of forecasted that this was going to happen with the table presence. Um, so I kept Gareth very calm and even. I was making sure to make eye contact with Sloan constantly it while we were playing. Eye contact. It was Sorry. staring. I was just staring while we were playing it, and Sloan felt very like uncomfortable with it and uh, like threatened during the actual game. Yeah, we play in the same room, 
So we live together, we play in the same room. So she was literally looking at me at the computers in front of us, and everyone else was like, why is she not looking at the screen the entire time? And I just really hated it. <laughs> and just making little shifts like that um, can really make your players uncomfortable and on edge. Um, and then on top of that, I uh, threw a CR9 dire werebear at Corey when she's level 7, and she's alone. Um, and so I went into this being like, I'm not trying to kill Corey. However, I do want to make her fight for her absolute life. And so in order to divine a combat like that for your players specifically, keep in mind opportunities and challenges. So in this case, I was throwing a lot of challenges at her. She was alone. This was a much higher stat block than she had. Um, and actually, I think that's it. I think those were the only two challenges I threw at her. Oh, um, Gareth is just ruthless. Um, I did end up biting her, but we can talk about that later. Um, and then two, I made sure to give her opportunities. I did not attack her in a completely isolated area. She was in the middle of the city. Um, so she had an opportunity to call for help, and she did. Um, I knew that she had a weapon that would actually be effective against the lycanthrope and would, would actually do damage. It wouldn't be completely useless. And I knew she had magic. She had the shield spell and several other things that she could use that kept her alive during this fight. Um, and so it, it was barely, but she managed to get Gareth down from like 162 hit points to 27 over the course of the fight before she dropped. Yeah, I mean, target, tar when you design a combat like that, target your player. Um, I get really bored during combat. Um, I mean this with the utmost love. I was kind of bored. Like last night, my character walked away from last night's combat with seven points of damage total. Meanwhile, we had a, two other PCs who were nearly downed. And it wasn't for lack of trying, it was just I really do strategize like where I'm putting my character when I'm using my resources X, Y, and Z. Um, and I loved this. It was so fun. I had to actually manage my resources. I had to think about what I was doing. Um, and I was cursing the way that I had organized like her bag and like the stuff that she actually carried with her. Because I did have a couple of items that I could have used. But again, I'm also running her as a teenager. And I'm like, yeah, she keeps this really important item definitely at the bottom of her bag. <laughs> um, and it was just an absolute blast. And it was also scary then also having immediately preceded this, the valid beef. Um, so if you're a player, if you have like a really smart player, you have someone, you're like, no, 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 no. I want you to be engaged. I want you to be interested. And I want you to like really remember this. Like, it's not the character you're building the combat for, it is absolutely the player, because your player is the one who's going to remember it no matter what. And their player will also determine what they actually enjoy versus don't enjoy. So again, none of my other players would have liked this. They would have felt very, they would have felt like it was very unfair um, and would have been just like, why would you do this to me? Or someone was like, oh my god, do it again. <laughs> um, with that, those are my three villains. You ready to transition into yours? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, um, hi guys, meet the party boys. Um, they were inspired by me getting tired of DMing all the time and me thinking like, God, what if I played a bar? I only played six. <laughs> go big or go home. Yeah. Really what they were... Wait, wait, God, say their name. Oh, you're so right. Um, we're going to start. In the pink, you have Zane Malice. Um, next to him, you have Chris Evans. Dylan Oboy. Up front, you have Harrison Pother. Brandon Hurry and Harry Jackson. <laughs> I ruined my session with them, by the way. When I introduced them, it was 45 minutes of someone trying to speak and then just not being able just to absolutely speak. Absolutely. We ended early. I was like, you know what? That's a wrap. Have fun, guys. <laughs> um, but I did really introduce them as a means of t teaching my party. Like, There's more to D and D than just hitting something. Like you can solve your problems peacefully. So I made bards that were like really popular, but they were charming people. They were being dishonest and they were disrupting my commerce and government, governance and all this stuff. But they were popular. And like you can't hit a celebrity, like that's not gonna go well for you. And then they decided to hit the celebrities anyway. Um, it didn't kill them though, just hit them. And so I said, okay, they're coming back and they're gonna hit harder. Absolutely. And so I designed a Group. Wow, you're right, I do do groups a lot. You do groups a lot. You're very good at them. Um, I did a massive group combat between my party and five out of the six party boys. Um, when they came back and said, you know what, we want revenge. And the party said, mm, that's valid. <laughs> um, and so I had a really streamlined system behind the screen because there's five people here, like five bards, and bards are complicated just on their own, of making sure like I know what they've used, all of their action economy for, how many spell slots they've had, and I know who's nerfing, who's buffing, who's actually doing the damage, and who's healing. 
and making sure they each sorted into like distinct roles. I think the most impactful part of my little streamlined setup though is that I had a checklist, like I said, of their action economy, their action, their bonus action, their movement, and their reaction for all five of them. And I would look at it at the end of every single round of combat and I needed every single box checked off because all of those cool abilities you have, your reactions, bonus actions, legendary actions, do not just exist there to make your stat block look cool, make them look longer, make them be scary. It is there to make your combat harder. And so by making sure I exhausted that action economy to my, the best of my ability, my players were struggling. Granted, like I'm sure playing against five bards actually would kind of be hard, Ooh, even hard. as like a DM. Um, but my players didn't know what to do. My players didn't know how to exhaust their action economy like that. And instead of the party boys teaching them, hey, maybe don't hit things, um, it taught my party. I think really the lesson I took away is the job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I learned from it. <laughs> Especially because I wasn't involved the first time the party met the party boys and caused problems. And so I was like, you guys did what? And just left them around? <laughs> yeah, so we got a little violent with them after this fight. You can go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say. Um, so fighting them was actually terrifying, which I hated because they looked like that. Um, <laughs> it was dead. like I play a bard and it, this felt like playing another d, &D party. Like they felt like they had the same extent of abilities. They were using Bardic Inspiration, they are using Bane and Bless, they were healing each other. Like I had never run into enemies that could heal each other like that because normally we're fighting a bunch of really scary monsters in Sloan's campaign. Um, so fighting a group of bards was really hard and our, my party is not good at strategy, quite frankly. Um, and so it was a struggle for us for a while. We really had to regroup and figure out who was going to be doing what, um, who, had a very important role kind of on the back line and figure out how to take them down and it took a while this was like a two session of combat it, it took a long time it was terrifying and i still think about it all the time which is offensive because they look like that <laughs> <laughs> um also yeah go ahead i just want to say uh being somebody that mostly runs regenerated adventures and things like that i have a question later on at the end for that um not only do i hate this <laughs> Absolutely feel free to. Um, just know that when you name drop them, your party's gonna look at you and be like, and what do they look like? They do that anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> they're like, what are the tax forms like last year? <laughs> You're like, why? How much money did they make? Yeah. I can't help it. Who was the bardiest of the party boys? Absolutely. Malice. Malice. Absolutely, 100%. He was the one that I had people under like mass suggestion. He was the pretty boy that I think flirted with and successfully maybe had a date with one of our party members? I don't remember. I don't remember either, actually. That was a weird infiltration mission she tried. What's up? How'd that first healing show go with the... I was so, we were all so <laughs> mad. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it was it was fairly early on because we were going really hard on trying to kill Zayn Malice. Uh, so hold on, I have a player, we actually, we both have, we share this player. Yeah. Um, she does not roll, I don't think I've ever seen her roll lower than like 15. And she, it's not, it's not Never. like her dice are weighted. You can give her dice to her sister, and her sister will roll straight once. It is just the player. Just for some reason, she's extremely lucky. Like she was regularly rolling like twenty sixes last night on everything. I was like, I can't. Okay. Um. So yeah, I, I popped that healing potion, but not potion. The spell pretty early, and they went, "You can't do that." I went, like, "You can." Isn't that good? We were like, no, 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 we can heal each other. And you're like, okay, then do it. And we were like, uh. We were suddenly scrambling, going, oh my god, I don't have a healing spell. Yeah, I must have healing spells. I must have healing. It was bad. It was a bad time. Like, I learned how to use Bardic Inspiration better from this combat <laughs> by watching Sloan use it in a very, like, streamlined way. Up next, we have Warren Kriska. Um, I do actually think Warren's probably the favorite NPC I have at the moment, and not because they're, like, particularly strong or anything. Um, Roran serves the BBEG in my campaign, and I introduced them as both an obstacle for my party and an opportunity because they were kind of looking at my campaign and going, I don't know where to start. What do you mean there's an entire empire to undermine? I said, you know what, that's so fair. Um, and my friend said, well, why don't you give the empire hill turns? Um, I was like, okay, sure, sure. Uh, and I made Roran. And so they're an obstacle in the sense of, if you look at their motivation, they are super arrogant. They think they're the smartest person to walk the earth. Well, maybe not the earth, but like walk this empire. And they want to be in charge of it. Okay. They want to be in charge of it. 
And as a result, when they see the party and they see the ways that the party is lying and the way that the party is not telling the truth to people and they're like clocking it, they're like, you, you're a threat to my personal goals, I'm gonna get you in trouble. Um, but they're an opportunity because in the same vein, that arrogance, that I'm perfect, I can't do anything wrong, like I serve the most powerful person in this empire, of course, like I am qualified to do what I please, um, they leave really sensitive information laying around in their bedroom, which they don't lock. Um, so my party has easy access to information that otherwise they wouldn't be able to get just by virtue of knowing Roran and getting some information out of Roran because Roran has kind of a big mouth. Um, and on its own, that's like, okay, cool, whatever, why are they so memorable? The, there's a little bit of a conflict between, okay, they stand in our way and also they give us good information. I have a lot of NPCs actually that do that in this empire if you play them right. The thing about Roran is that they're a brat. They're so easy to hate, and it comes across in the table presence. Um, because you gotta act out your characters, you really gotta commit to the bit. Um, and with Roran, they have tone, they have eye rolls, or lack of eye contact, they have deliberate pauses, and it really, like, Roran tells you that they think you're dumb and ugly without ever saying it. Um, there's no insight role necessary whatsoever. And I think the moment that my players really clocked it was when they met Roran, I think, for the second time. And were like, wow, we can learn a lot of information from you. Let's ask you a ton of questions, because you're so happy to flex how much smarter than us you are. Um, and at the end of it, Roran fully went, oh, well, uh, you know, right across the river there is a library. I don't know if you've ever been. Um, but all of the books that you are looking for, with all the information that you're asking about, are actually right up front, and it's free. Um, so once I drop you off at your lodgings for the night, if you want to go over there, you can learn everything, and I don't have to be your personal tour guide. <laughs> Though I'm happy to help. Uh, and my players went fair, like, the, again, the game paused, and they went, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> we had similar reactions, you got you like, Hang on. <laughs> Whoa. Which again, also, if you say that with a normal tone of, oh, hey, I don't know if you know, but right across the river there's a library. I don't know if you've ever been, um, but all of the books that you're looking for are actually right up front, and they're free. Um, once I drop you off at your lodgings, like, go check it out. That'd be so cool. And then, like, I don't have to be your personal story. I, ha, ha, ha. Totally different. Totally different. Commit to your character and make them mean. Make them bratty. And then, that obstacle that they pose, becomes a lot more irritating. And the fact that they're an opportunity for really good information becomes a lot more irritating. My players hate interacting with Warren, and they know that there's some information they can only get by interacting with Warren. Yeah, Warren is words that I cannot say. Um, but <laughs> like I, I love Warren, but I also absolutely hate Warren with my full being. One, because they're a narc, and that just kills me. Um, they're constantly trying to get us in trouble, and they have the most goofy it and it makes me so mad because they're actually correct that we are up to no good we are trying to undermine their empire but like shut up about it stop being so happy um and then two they just it really like every single thing they say is super inflammatory and really like derogatory towards the party and it drives us all insane like i normally don't find sloan's npcs and look at them but i hate you i actually want you dead before i really consider it i really do i'm like mm -hmm. Did you know what they noticed? They will. Um, it's, just, it's, it's shockingly effective, the combination of like table presence and that opportunity and obstacle. And again, like I said, I have other NPCs that serve the same purpose, almost serve the exact same role as Roran, just for like people a little bit lower down in the empire. My players don't hate them. Don't hate them at all. They're like, yeah, I mean, you kind of suck, but you, specifically, I'm waiting for the first opportunity I can kill you with plausible deniability. Yeah, they're also actually kind of dangerous because they do work really high up and so they're arrogant and they think they're correct all the time which makes me be like, ah, you're probably harmless. No, they're not. They're not harmless. And that's, what's the, that's the scary part. They actually got my character in some pretty huge trouble and they were so happy about it and it made me so mad. And last but not least, we have another two slider. This is Leander Bishop. Uh, scariest man you'll ever meet. I do hate to say he's probably my most successful villain because I just, he's so slimy. I don't like him. Like, I don't, I like him, but I don't like him. 
Um, he comes from, again, that kind of like prequel thing I was talking about. So when I am going through this, I want you to understand, going into the, our like one-shots campaign that we play, um, my players know they're going to lose. Like there's a catastrophe that happens that sets up the entire setting for the future campaign. <laughs> I don't know what you just read, but yes. <laughs> um, but Leander is really an exercise in what characterization can do when your indirect and your direct characterization line up. Um, I have his motivation and his righteousness on there because it really gives you context for who he is. Um, I know I just said Warren thinks I'm the smartest person to walk the earth. Leander genuinely, he knows it. In his bones, he's like, I am the smartest person here. This is my world. I can do with it what I wish. Um, and so my party doesn't know he's the villain, doesn't know what's coming for them. I just start the session with, hey, just so you guys know, if you play tonight wrong, you're all going to die before you're supposed to. Um, and they're like, okay, that's cool. And then they get the mission of some guy going, hey, can you go to this magical field all the way up north and pick some flowers for my boyfriend, please? And they're like, how is this TPK territory? <laughs> um, and they get there, there's Faye that are like, oh my god, don't come in here, like, we don't want you here, like, no, we won't let any more people die. Like, then they're walking through the fields after they've like diffused that situation and they're literally finding the corpses like 50 75 hundreds of corpses of like dead fae that aren't like ripped limb from limb or anything they're just lifeless on the ground like unmoving and they're like okay that's really actually quite scary i also still can't find the flowers we're looking for guess we're going to keep going um and they stumble across a trap that Leander has put up because, you know, despite the fact he's like, this is my role, I can do what I want. He knows people don't agree with him. Um, they diffuse it and then they look up essentially and see this tall black dragonborn um, who, now they think about it, they're like, oh, someone said something about a scary black lizard guy. Maybe, maybe this is it. Except he doesn't really look even like a normal dragonborn. He's got all these gadgets and gizmos that make him look really otherworldly and really frightening. He's got metal arms, he's got these weird goggles, he's got this magical staff and these freaky little boots. Um, and you look at him and you're hearing him describe and you're hearing the words that he says as they like start engaging with him. And all of the insane scary things that they have heard leading up to him are now lining up. Like the person they are interacting with, they heard about him, he would do that, wouldn't he? Like he looks like he would. Um, and it really frightened my party. Like, just point like here, they didn't even get there. They're like, I'm so scared to figure out what's doing this. And then they met him, they went, I found the TPK territory. It's so much worse than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I cannot emphasize you to you enough, like, the amount of dread me and the other players felt when we were going through this field and, like, picking up on all this indirect characterization and being like, oh my god, this, can, this guy's going to kill us. Like, absolutely. And then we got there, and Sloan's word choice um, and we'll get to Tate Burton for in a minute, but the way she, that she decided to play Leander was just as terrifying as all the indirect characterization that we got. Like, it was genuinely very unsettling being in the same room as she was doing this. I was like, I gotta go. <laughs> it, was, it was very memorable, especially because he would turn on a dime and go from being kind of reasonable, kind of talking to us, to being like, I'm gonna kill you right now if you said it did something slightly offensive. That does bring up, yes, go ahead. Go back. Uh, no, I think it's probably going to go on like this slide. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, the thing about Leander, though, that I think really made him stand out was the tape presence. Um, a lot like Roran, uh, he has a certain tone, he has some inflection that really makes him stand out. But I need to emphasize to you all, Leander is unwell. Deeply, deeply unwell. He is delusional, and he is so convinced that his delusions are correct. And I wanted that to come across so clearly to my players. And he had just this very unsettling rhythm. Like he didn't, I made sure I did not talk the way any normal, reasonable, sane person would talk. Um, and again, we play on Skype, so go ahead. He was a taste of what was like. That's what she's getting um, to actually. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna say the sentence that he said that I watched her face fall with. I'm gonna say it with my normal voice and then I'll like mess it up. Um, which is, do you really want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the strongest member of the Rising Suns? Which is like his little adventuring group that he's with. Like, yeah, oh, okay. And they're like, okay, maybe. That's not that scary. Like, follow yourself. Great. Um, no, it was at the end of the conversation where like he was clearly already agitated. He just went, do you really want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the strongest member of the Rising 
sucks. And like, I didn't even do his voice. Like, I don't even think I could right now. I had to practice his voice for like four days before I ran the session. Um, and just that difference in the rhythm and the inflection makes all the difference. Like, why did you say it like that? Even I say it, I'm like, why did you say it like that? And it really got across to my players, like, he's not, he's, you can be the most logical person in the world, you can make a convincing argument, and he is not going to hear you. He has anger problems and the strength and conviction to act on them. Um, body language and also singling players out worked really well, even though we played on Skype. Um, I don't really know how the body language came across, but I was like, I got the feedback afterwards of like, I don't know how you did that, but that was frightening. It was more um, of like leaning and like tapping on things and like looking at the ceiling. And then when she was talking, like singling out a player, she would like lean forward and look at them specifically while speaking like that. And it was like, I gotta go. <laughs> um, but what I think made the rest of the combat so frightening is like, yeah, he was overpowering. It was kind of the same way like Gareth versus Corey was overwhelming and like he really didn't stand a chance. Um, my players didn't stand a chance, they weren't meant to. I told them they were gonna lose if they tried, and they tried anyway, stupid as a stupid does. Um, but Leander's personality sh shined in his ruthlessness. He was always going for a kill. He had the strength and the conviction to know like, you know what, the last person who hit me, getting all of my wrath. He had three attacks that hit very hard, and if you hit him last, you were getting all three of them. Did not matter. And that meant like if they strategized and one person hit him one round and one person hit him the next, like he would just turn. He didn't care if you took the opportunity attack. He didn't care if you were 60 feet away. He was coming for you. Do not try to run. Um, but throughout this also, he's muttering to himself. He's saying things. He's making himself angrier because he has been interrupted. No one understands his genius. Even his party members are sending people to interrupt him. This is unfair. How come people can't see his vision? Yada, 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 yada. And he's just not talking to my players. And they're sitting there like, why is he doing this? I'm like, why is he doing it? Like, you interrupted his scientific work. He's very upset with you. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so my, my character actually got absolutely eviscerated during this combat, um, fully knocked unconscious and stabbed while on the ground. I was like, that makes sense. Um, had to happen because otherwise we were not going, like, and I cannot emphasize this enough, we were not going to get out of this combat alive. All of us were going to die if we did not specifically sacrifice one person. Because Lander had built of speed. Um, even if we used our full action to dash, we could not outpace him. Um, and so he would just appear and be like, hey, where are you going? And then just start killing people. Um, and so we ended up having to way split the party in order to get him, over, to prevent him from killing everybody. Um, and just that lethality and that like ruthlessness during the fight was so scary because we knew that we jumped into a fight we weren't going to be able to win. And we knew that this was kind of a useless e endeavor, but we were all playing very moral characters. Like that's what they would do. They'd be like, this is wrong. We have to confront this. Um, and it was just terrifying to, in the middle of the fight, realize that he was going to use all three attacks and a construct and his magic items on you. Um, and that it, oh, and yeah, and that you could not run specifically. We talk about this combat all the time. Like, I drew, I drew this shortly after the combat. That was my character getting eviscerated. Um, and I was like, this, this, that's what it felt like fighting Leander. It was terrifying. Um, and we don't have an actual like closing. So actually, real quick, I think you said you were gonna have a question. Do you still have yeah. it? Um, so were any of the spells that be like were they or are they all just straight up? I only do the spells that like come out of official published content. Um, I'm very confident my ability to design <coughs> balanced monsters for my party. I am not confident my ability to design balanced spells. I just. I still have like parts of the DMG that I haven't touched, and before I do that, like I really want to make sure that I understand like how spells are supposed to be designed. Yes. How do you uh, decide on stats for a stat block for a character? Like, what what is it that you use to figure out the balance? For That's a slow question. Fun helpers most of her things. Um. So I. None of the monsters I ever homebrew could be published. I'm gonna tell you that right now. They are not blanket applicable because, quite frankly, I have a player that rolls nothing lower than a 15. Um, makes it really hard, and then I have another player who I don't think has ever rolled higher than a 15. <laughs> <laughs> but for a lot of it, I base it on 
not only what I think their personality is and how they would have developed, but also the strategy and how I want to run them. There is a vision that I see for this villain, this monster, and then I figure out ways to get my stats to really line up with that. And it took me a very long time to realize, especially when making humanoid uh, creatures, they don't behave like PCs, don't treat them like PCs. They're allowed to be scarier, they're allowed to hit harder. Um, I also just use the homebrew monster like challenge rating table a lot. Um, and so I just make sure my numbers fall in between there, do the math between like their defensive CR and their offensive CR, and make sure they land roughly in the right spot. And then because I have that one player, I just dial them up a little bit more. Um, and uh, cover your ears. Um, I do lie about their HP all the time. Ah. <laughs> all the time. Um, I do it too. When I tell you that this player I'm talking about rolled three nat 20s last night, um, thank God I wasn't the DM. It was because, rough, like, dude. <laughs> it was so rough. There's just, I've never once balanced my HP correctly when she's playing. Everyone else, I can do it. Fine. It's fine. The CR table is correct. You're okay. Her? No. I lie about it all the time when she's playing. I'm like, oh no, they're still alive. They're at negative like 25 hit points. <laughs> like, they're still going. I'm like, no, they got three rounds left in them for sure. <laughs> um, I will say the trick when you do that though is your players won. Let them win. Don't kill a PC once they've already won. You can instill the fear of God in them, but if you're going to lie to make it more interesting, you got to let your players win where they've won already. Yeah, find a narratively sound spot that feels good and feels satisfying for your players to be like, okay, now they're dead. Did that answer your question? Okay, cool. And in case, we'll get to your question in just a second, but um, in case it wasn't clear when Sloan was mentioning the like um, homebrew monster stat block thing to do, you can find that on 5e tools. No, that's okay. I never know what the website's Yeah, they, it's 5e tools and they have specifically like a um, CR calculator that is actually really good that can help you create stuff like that that she introduced me to. I think it tends to overestimate the lethality just a little bit. Because um, I think I plugged in a monster that D and D has published, and it was like one or two challenge ratings higher than what D, like Wizards of the Coast labeled it. And I was like, that's weird. That's weird. And so when I've been making things, I'm like, okay, I've got to adjust you a little bit. This says you're a challenge rating 14. You're probably a 12. All right. Yes. So I actually, with my players, um, I mostly run, like I said, like regenerate things, official adventure pass for Pathfinder Second Edition. Um, but I have, well, they're all built for four players. My main group that I DM for is six to seven, depending on who shows up that day. When it comes to monsters, boss monsters, villains, and their subordinates, which do you believe is better, powering up the person, the villain, the monster, by, by upping their stats, or giving them underlings to assist them, introducing more monsters there? She taught me the answer to this recently. Um, <laughs> it is absolutely the underlings because you have to divide the action economy. Um, with the Barty boys, my players struggled with it so much because all five. Five? There's five of you. Yes. Yeah. yeah, all five of them could not just hit one of them over and over and over and over again. And it does become kind of apparent after a minute, like when you've started lying about your monster, or like when you've made them so overwhelming and so powerful that it's no longer fun to fight against. Versus when you give them underlings and the underlings still pack a punch, you have to make decisions. Your squishy little spellcasters can't just go, oh, it's fine, they're right next to me, I'm gonna focus on that guy. They're gonna go, I have 30 hit points and you do 15 points of damage. Ooh, so sorry, barbarian, you're gonna wait a second. And they're gonna have to deal with it. And it's gonna divide their attention and make your fights go on a bit longer without you actually having to do too much math. Something that was also totally, sorry, I saw several hands go at the same time. But it's totally changed my like perspective of combat design in d and It's something that Sloan taught me, which is alternative win conditions. Oh, that's a good um, so think about adding things to your combat that will help your party like technically win the fight that aren't just kill the enemy. Um, so for example, there was a combat that we did in Sloan's campaign where there were a group of hostages that were being like slowly transformed into stone during the combat. Um, and half the party was like, great, let's kill the people that are doing it. So the spell stops. And the other half was like, we're not going to have time. Like, we need to save the hostages. And it totally split the party and made the fight a lot harder. Um, so something like that, keeping in mind the space and like really spreading out your enemies also has a huge impact on your party. Because there's a big difference between all five of your party members hitting one person versus just two. I think 
think um, you have an orange shirt on, you have your hand up first. So, you kind of addressed my question with your earlier answer, but I'll ask anyway. Uh, when you're making a bit, uh, and you mentioned some of your party has been murder a couple of have you ever tried to figure out how do I make them defeat this villain without killing them or even possibly combat? Depending on how mean you're feeling. I think there's someone in the back. Yeah? Can you repeat the question? Oh, um, he was asking how to like introduce your characters to a villain that they aren't going to engage in combat with, like a villain that they have to defeat outside of combat or with other means, correct? Um, especially if your partner, partner's murder hoboey, you know how to deal with that specifically. I don't have a great answer because in the beginning of us playing, I straight up had to look at them eventually and be like, stop killing everything. You're mad at me that you're not getting information. You murdered the first person who's slightly rude to you when you started this interaction off like that. I don't want to hear it. Um, but a little more recently, um, the BBEG for my campaign actually is likely not going to be resolved with combat. Um, they were... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this man has my absolute animosity. <laughs> they were friends with him. He provided them like a lot of kindness, a lot of sympathy, and I made it so that he does have enough flaws and enough footholds that my party, by like befriending him, and, like becoming close to him, could kind of just weasel their way in there and go, here's a flaw in your logic, here's a flaw in your logic, here's where your trauma is informing like, what you're doing. Um, and it infuriates my party to know it, because they're like, what if we just killed him? Like, what if we just went to his office right now and stabbed him? What's he going to do? And but we care about him. But, but he's so sweet, and he gives us tea all the time. There's also a really important detail you're forgetting, which is he's dating one of the PCs. Okay, but he wasn't doing that when I made him originally, and y'all still liked him. <laughs> yeah, he's a surrogate dad to my PC, and then he's dating one of the other PCs. So we're like emotionally connected to this character, because before we knew him as the BBEG, he was our primary ally. Wait, so does that mean one of your party members is also like your mom? Yes, this is actually yes. a conversation they have quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, my character has two dads and one mom. That's just how it is. Don't worry about it. So um, when creating a, a villain like that, where you're trying to like balance your characters to try and like think about what they're going to do and try to create an emotional connection to it, I have a player that can be emotionally connected to it, but he doesn't always like think about how his character would be emotionally connected to it. So even if his character is, he doesn't necessarily think about that. It might just be like, oh, they made a bad decision. They're dead now. Like, how yeah. do you balance this is, that? This is Sloan's primary <laughs> quandary in her campaign. Um, I would say, because for some reason, first of all, the players, we, have, we share the same players. They play very differently it's in my just, campaign. And they no, don't no. <laughs> this makes me so angry. Same exact group. The only difference is we swap out one of us is DMing the other one is not. They're terrified in her campaign. They proceed with so much caution. They are nice and they start off on friendly terms. They're like, oh my god, we're in so much danger all the time in like a place that is nothing but sunshine and rainbows. You're in my campaign and you're actively in a place that's like undergoing a life-threatening like invasion. And they're like, Oops, so did your friend die? That's a bummer. <laughs> Tell me about it. It's really different, and I think I think part of it is the way that you decide to use your narration as a DM, um, and the other part of it is the information that you decide to share about NPCs. So even if you have a party that isn't, and I, I say NPCs even though you ask about PCs, because they, they can push your PCs into really interesting directions. So for example, we have some players in my campaign that don't really think about how their character feels a lot. So I literally kidnapped one of them and was like, hey, how do you feel about your backstory? They're like, what? Like confronted them with the whole backstory, confronted them with the character and was like, oh, you got sold, that sucks. <laughs> like really just pushed them into that uncomfortable situation that forced them to think about it. And they came out of that interaction being like, I don't think my PC trusts humans. And I was like, okay, unexpected, but that makes sense. <laughs> um, it's also worth noting, like sometimes you have to remind them you're the DM, you spend a lot more time thinking about D&D than they do. Yeah. This is a harsh reality I've had to confront many times. Um, they just might have forgotten. You might have been like, well, I've combed through your backstory, yada, 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 and they're like, who's Basil? I don't even remember using that name. Like, just prompt them. Like, give them the opportunity in-game to, like, think about it for a second. What were you going to say in the back? Is it a comment or is it a question? Oh, okay, then hold on. Sorry, give me one sec. Um, another thing I would say as well is um, reminding them of those emotional threads throughout the session 
really helps. So for example, last night, um, one of my other players who isn't super in tune with her character, and I wanted her to be more in tune with like the emotional side of it, I kept reminding her, like, hey, the shapeshifter you're fighting right now looks like your mom that you saw die in front of you. And I just kept set, like just kept bringing that up and being like, yeah, as you're going to attack her, it feels very familiar. You see that flash of like when your actual mom died. Um, and it ended up making it a lot more emotional because I kept bringing up that emotional threat even though they didn't recognize it. It's a, it's a part, big part of the narrative storytelling that I was at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I do real quick just want to say we are over on our time, so let me do my like small conclusion for this, and then like we, I'm happy to chit chat. We can do it as a group still if we want. It, it can be individual. I don't care. Um, but when you're designing a villain and you think of that first side, our personality versus oh god, please versus the mechanics. Um, your personality is going to make your villain like strong, and your mechanics are going to make them stand out. They don't have to be heavy hitters in all six categories. Um, those are just going to be your best villains when you make them that way. But as we kind of demonstrated, like the Barty boys were memorable and it was more because they looked like that. Um, <laughs> it was because their stat block and their combat design was really difficult. And um, Arya, the queen, is really memorable, not because really, like her motivation was sad and everything, she was sympathetic, but it was that mismatch of expectations. It was the way that the characterization was executed. And so if you really only nail one of them, that's fine. But working to make sure you have all six of them kind of thought through for every villain you want to leave an impression or every antagonist is going to make your villains stand out more than, again, just someone who stands there, is kind of snarky, kind of mean, kind of arrogant, and then does nothing but hits your party back and forth like it's a game of uh, ping pong. Yeah, just really think about also what you as a DM are really comfortable with, what you excel at. Um, and what you feel like you can achieve. So if you're sitting there and you're like, I want to make a really sympathetic bill, and you're like, I really struggle with the RP part of this, or like, I'm not sure how to do that, you can certainly get there, but like, pick the things that work for you that you feel very comfortable with with your villain, and you don't have to be like, no, this is a Leander Bishop, like, this is someone who hits on every single front, terrifying combat design, terrifying personality, you don't have to go for that immediately. Like, you can find villains that are still very memorable and effective for other reasons, like some of this Cool. We can resume questions now if no one wants to leave, but also this is your cue that you're free to go if you yeah, don't want to listen to Because you feel trapped, anymore. you can go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. yes. Um, right in the back. So, speaking of key that you see with Ravina, how did you introduce Ravina at the table into the party as <laughs> I want to tell this one actually because again I was so angry about this. This came up because I had messaged my friend who hadn't been there for a few sessions and I was like, hey, they didn't ask about this and she went, what do you mean they didn't ask about that? I'm like, they didn't ask about it. She went, are they stupid? And I went, yes. Um, <laughs> and so we're sitting there and she had the actual player character RPing this um, imposter the entire time. She was just normal, she was doing her thing. And the second she went under a little bit of scrutiny and the second she rolled a natural one on a deception check, I uh, she here. started picking up the dialogue. She just instantly started talking and started being the character, oh. and the two who didn't question it sat there and went, what? Hold on. Hold on. I had to stay quiet, because again, we play on the same screen, and she's talking, I'm like, told you. She like, told you. I told you. And they were sitting there, and that was one of those moments where we were like, how did this happen? And then they went, as they realized their horrible, horrible mistake. Um, they were like, oh, you did tell us she was a shapeshifter. Like, not directly, but we got there. We ignored that.